Uh, I'm Jeff, and I'm going to tell you guys about orchestration, whatever that means. A little bit about me, wrote Docker in action. I blog a lot, pretty regularly. Um, oh, can I get the slides? There's a picture of me for people in the back. Um, I blog a lot on Medium, um, fairly regularly. Uh, I'm, a I'm a professional engineer, and these days, mostly consultant. Um, I work with a lot of startups and a lot of Fortune 100s. I do training, I run a website, it's just all about me. Um, and before I got into this whole Docker world thing, I had heaps of orchestration experience at Amazon. And we'll get into why that's relevant in a minute. So I wanna go over what is orchestration. I actually wanna to try to come up with a better definition than what we've heard a lot the last ye years. Um, I wanna give you a couple of examples, go over what abstractions are, talk about the open source community a little bit. And uh, then I want to get into you know, what the abstractions are, architecture components, failures. And at the end, I want to demo an orchestration platform that I wrote in the last month of Sundays. Um, so let's talk about it. So what is this orchestration thing? Well, if you were unfortunate enough to be working or using computers before like 2005, what orchestration really entailed was a whole lot of hours, you know, copying, paste, or like shipping files between servers manually, uh, jumping into sessions and, and starting processes. Um, maybe it looked like some Perl wizardry or some super like person proprietary bash scripts or AKA job security. Um, and, and really, like, the, the pinnacle before 2005 was this really luxurious experience that were provided by application servers, um, which everyone thought was just so cool. Like, everyone was trying to build the biggest and best application server. Um, but I like to say that the first time you really encounter orchestration, having lived without it, you may experience the urge to laugh, cry, or both or other things. Uh, it's a very intense experience. Kind of like this. <laughs> First time you experience real orchestration that is provided with a simple interface, you are everyone in this picture. The guy who just had his heart ripped out is you five minutes ago. Right? You have no idea what just happened. You're completely terrified. Your entire world has been turned upside down. And the guy in the forefront holding the heart is you. Now, with this new knowledge, you feel like a master of the universe. You have no idea what you can do. This is crazy. So the first time I encountered real orchestration was proprietary systems in Amazon. Internally, Amazon uses a system called Apollo. They've since opened it up through AWS. It's called Code, Depl Code Deploy. Um, and really, it was the first time that I saw a deployment described as an entity. Right? This nice abstraction. Um, I also happened to work on the Amazon Marketplace feeds and reports team. We owned a gigantic orchestration platform for processing requests, um, input and output documents. Uh, it had all the, the, the telltale signs. It was clustered, resource aware, scheduling, and, and had uh, state, uh, desired state management. Um, and it was like living in a different world. I, <laughs> Immediately coming, the job that I came from immediately into this one, it was, I mean, it was like Maven-based deploys and, and long hours manually copying things around. It was really, really rough. And I came to a world where, oh, I had my build artifacts compiled, and then I wanted to deploy to a couple thousand nodes around the planet, and I clicked a button on a web page, and then I watched a progress bar. Like, that was intense. That was definitely a heart-holding moment. So my observational description of orchestration is a system that provides control of high-level abstractions, which imply certain deployment and lifecycle management semantics. It has nothing to do with containers. It has nothing to do with virtual machines. It has nothing to do with processes. I mean, the implementation thereof has to do with those things. The implementation thereof has to do with software-defined networks. But it's really about the abstraction. The orchestration platform is the tool that provides the abstraction, right? 
And so in, in looking at, at this space, we kind of have to start under, making sure that we understand those abstractions, that those abstractions are clear, right? Container is an abstraction around a very specific set of, of constructs around processes, right? Like just Docker itself is an orchestration platform. We don't really call it that because there's no distributed system really kind of built into it. Well, at least there wasn't. Um, and so these abstractions are force mul multipliers for communication. I can say service, and a lot of people in this room know what I'm talking about, right? Instead of, oh, the, I've got processes that are spread across multiple machines that requests are load balanced to that serve HTTP requests. You know, I just rather say service. So then you know, post-2005-ish, we started getting a lot of open source orchestration. And this was configuration management tools. We had a lot of cloud-specific tools. Cloud formation kind of changed the game for a lot of people. Um, and then all of a sudden, we started getting a lot of container platform open source stuff. And uh, with, with Swarm, UCP, Kubernetes, Mesosphere, Rancher, and, and you know, these, all these things kind of exploded uh, with, with the momentum that we had from the, the ongoing DevOps revolution, um, and then kind of like just having the gasoline uh, that is Docker kind of thrown onto the fire uh, in, in 2013, and it was just, it was, uh, this is actually a picture of me in May 2013 when I, when I installed Graphite in under 30 seconds and had it running. Um, I was out of control maniac at the moment. So container orchestration, really, even that breaks down. You could say Swarm, but really what we're talking about is Docker, Lib Network, Swarm, Compose, etcd, slash console, slash Zookeeper. You could say Kubernetes, which is this long list of tools. You could say Mesos, which is this long list of tools, really. But they kind of all have the same pieces. They kind of all provide similar abstractions. Right? We've got, so here's some, here's some abstractions that are pretty high level. We've got container, you could have a composition, which is something composed or with a pod. You've got a service, we know what that is, right? We've got replication controllers, which has additional semantics, lifecycle semantics. Um, you have jobs, which are very, uh, very good specialization, or you just have talking about deployments. So in these platforms, you have these common architectures, right? You have a front end, that provides some really obvious features. You have to be able to control this thing. Humans or integrated platforms have to be able to control it. Um, you need some kind of visibility into the system to understand what's happening, because we are talking about something that's heavily automated. In the back end, you have a whole bunch of tools that provide some services that you don't really need to know. You don't ever really interact with them. These are the automation, right? We need to manage a compute resource pool. We need to define logical networks um, not just physical ones. We need to manage storage. That's an entire mind-blowing space in itself. Um, and, you know, and just desired state is kind of running across all of these. That's a, it's managing that desired state. And finally, your authentication and authorization integrations. It would be nice to have some, some abstractions around that. So in the interface, standard stuff, right? This is kind of obvious. You've got a web interface, maybe a CLI and definitely an API. Well, what do they actually do? Well, in every platform I've ever seen, they interact specifically and directly with the system of record, all right? The system of record is kind of like, I mean, that this is where all of these systems keep the state that they're trying to maintain, right? This is, this is the authority. Um, and, and, and oftentimes, it acts as like the communication bus, right? So far, common open source stuff, we see a lot of key value stores. We, just, we see distributed, durable databases. Um, they've got cool things like distributed locks, which is incredibly powerful. Um, and more and more, you see things relying on, on record observation or watches, um, as they're called in certain platforms. And we'll get to that in a minute. So all those things kind of feed into the real thing that makes these platforms come alive, which are the agent source control loops. Um, these are the things that maintain the desired state, that actually put things into action. These are the automation. 
Um, they react to state changes, so they're constantly watching that system of record. And, they con and they, they're the ones, they're, they're the diff, diff engines that say, this happened, this is what needs to happen in order to recover that state. And they calculate the deltas on the fly. Um, and a lot of these things are, are state manipulators, and so maybe they, you can only have one running in a distributed system, which most orchestration platforms are designed for distributed systems, so you need some kind of leadership election mechanism. So there, here's just a list of, of random control loops that kind of came to my, my mind, right? Like you've got your container rescheduler, rescheduler, right? Which is something that everyone likes to talk about their scheduler. Half the time when you say, when you start talking about orchestration, the first thing everyone jumps to is like, well, our scheduler, blah, 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 blah. Like, well, there's a little bit more to orchestration than a scheduler. There's how it interacts with the rest of the platform, but you've got other things. You've got cluster node registrars. You've got service node registrars. Um, you've got local supervisors, you've got service controllers which maintain desired state of a service and the semantics associated with a service. If you came up with a, with a service um, abstraction that, that had facilities for redundancy, right? like say you wanted to be able to survive a data center outage plus a host outage, you could have a service abstraction that provided that. Right? Um, and so it needs to know what those semantics are so it can maintain it. It's the entire job of it. Or a job controller, which is kind of the same thing. So across all these different pieces, and in, in their implementations, for every system I've ever looked at, which is quite a few, you end up with a few basic patterns that are just kind of repeated over and over and over again. And kind of my point of this talk in not diving into a specific platform is because I think it's more important to understand these patterns. Because if you understand these patterns that happen again and again and again, you can really begin on a solid foundation to understand whatever or whichever orchestration platform you're adopting, right? So state observation is the big one, right? The, the watching some system of record for changes to state uh, and, and reacting to changes of, of real state, um, that's your entire feedback mechanism for control loops. Entity lifecycle for a graph. These are the codified semantics for each of your abstractions, right? Um, and then registration and discovery. In my abstract, I said it's not just service registration and discovery. It's not just, but it is a lot of registration and discovery. Any time where you have a distributed system, you need to find each other, right? The, the pieces have to find each other. Nodes have to find each other. The manager has to be able to discover the nodes in your cluster. Services need to register themselves so that other members of that service can find each other or consumers of that service can find each other. Um, and the same thing just kind of happens over and over and over again. If you get out to low to high entropy network integration, you know, like your load balancers or your DNS service need to know which of the nodes in your network contribute which service, right? So you have another registration and discovery pattern. And so understanding these patterns will help you solve some problems. So right now you might be feeling like this guy, like, okay, this sounds really complicated. I'm totally ready for something to come along and rip my heart out so I can feel like the powerful guy again. Um, but let's actually talk about what breaks first. So Jerome mentioned that I had done some scale testing. Um, I've built incredibly large clusters. I've built incredibly small clusters. I've built all sorts of ad hoc clusters. I've, I've abused certain mechanisms. Um, and so, what breaks? So some common issues, well, the first one's not really an issue, it's just stuff that you end up always having to do. You can't just kind of turn one of these things on and assume, that, okay, it's all done, right? You still need that high to low entropy uh, service discovery and routing mechanism. Um, this is becoming less of a problem with some of the recent advancements, um, but you still, at the end of the day, need to tie it with your existing infrastructure. And most commonly, the things that you experience are things that you'd experience without the orchestration. Um, service goes, uh, stuff, stuff going down. I mean, 99% of the time, it's, it's either an underlying tech that's having a problem or your app itself. Um, but that's not always the case. So with clustering, the system of record is this huge single point of failure, right? If, if this system goes down, not only can nothing discover itself, can, can discover, none of the components can discover the other components, but none of them can register themselves. Um, 
none of them, like the, the control loops suddenly have no idea what the, what the state is supposed to be or what it currently is, right? The entire bus goes down, that's a huge problem. So people end up using these durable distributed databases. Um, another issue is something isn't showing up, which means, hey, the rest of my system looks great, but this new node I brought up isn't showing up or isn't participating in a network or whatever. Well, I mean, really, realistically, whenever you encounter one of these problems where something isn't there or something isn't being routed to a certain node or something like that, it's almost always a failure or a breakdown in that registration discovering process. Right? So you know, go straight to the registration and discovery tools involved in that particular failure. Right? And, and they're, they're almost always the same. There's only so many different ways you can implement the observer pattern. Right? It, it just go check it out. Like the, really, the code is never that intimidating. Networking stress is a huge one. Um, we were talking about clusters here. So you've got M, N machines running M containers on an overlayer virtual network, not that that really matters, but really all of these machines and need, to under, need to know about all of the network changes on all of those containers. So if you've got a thousand nodes that need to know about every change or every renewal of participation for 30,000 containers, like that's an amazing amount of traffic and it's an amazing amount of accounting and you're pumping it through a key value store that's optimized for durability, not for write throughput, right? And, 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 that, and that key value store notifies everybody because we want to get to as close to instantaneous uh, updates as possible through watches. And so what that means is that key value store then has to turn around and it's responsible for pushing, for pushing out the updates, right? So you can see this magnification with, with these growing cluster sizes. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, that's a big deal. But realistically, I mean, you have to be pushing very, very large clusters um, in order to really see that kind of stuff. In, in practice, I mean, even the 1,000 known clusters dealt with it pretty well. And with some of the changes that have been announced recently, they're going to deal with it, I would anticipate, much better. I haven't tested it, but there's less network, right? So the last kind of area that everyone ends up having to deal with are the platform lifecycle itself, right? Like, what does my upgrade mechanics look like? Do I have to do like this stupid special dance that we used to have to do when we're upgrading our database schemas and like some of our like three different services over here or, or, or whatever? Um, is it possible to roll back mid-upgrade? Like, what if we mess something up? Can we change it? Uh, are we forced into blue-green? I can't answer that generically because it's going to vary a lot based on the implementation of these things, right? Um, but it's one of the first questions you should ask before adopting one of these platforms. You want to know, okay, these things are rapidly moving. How often should I expect to have to upgrade? What do those upgrades look like? Am I going to be tearing my hair out? Uh, am I going to feel like that guy in the cage? But realistically, I don't think you have to feel like that guy in the cage. Right? I think, I honestly think that this space and these patterns are simple enough and, and general enough that everyone can have the confidence that uh, they're still holding the heart on this one. Um, so that kind of being said, what I want to do is kind of show that some of this stuff in practice. Because these systems are great and they're being, they're being pushed forward by some really awesome competition and some brilliant people. But at the end of the day, they're, solve, they're trying to solve problems for literally everyone in this room. And I could talk to any eight people and I'd get eight different desires from what they want for their orchestration, right? And so it's kind of on us. We've got these great open source tools. How do we actually make it, make it fit for us, right? Where do we take them? So I like to extend things. I'm kind of a tinker like that. Um, but here's some possible new abstractions, right? A feed which is like a job that takes an input document, potentially large, and runs through it and makes a whole bunch of changes. Or conversely, a report, which takes no input document, but always produces some output document, right? Those are specializations of job, right? But you need some additional mechanism in order to provide or retrieve those documents. Or request 
that takes input and output, and maybe you use something like that to build a quote unquote serverless architecture or an implementation of a serverless architecture. Um, cron jobs are pretty obvious, and there's lots of good hacks for building those things out there. Um, but why not make it a first class abstraction? Or what about user or collections of users? It would be a nice, a really good abstraction to be able to push around, which don't necessarily have anything to do with running processes. Well, my current favorite failure injection. So failure injection um, is the practice of putting your money where your mouth is, or your time and, and operational pain where your mouth is. Um, it's having owned hundreds of services, the, one of the first things I like to ask in code review is how confident are you in these changes, right? If I see somebody that has contributed a, a patch with 10% code coverage, <laughs> it's a pretty easy question to ask. And if they say, yeah, I'm super confident, I'm like, okay, well, are you willing to take on call for the first week that this goes live, knowing that we process a million requests per minute? And, and maybe they are, and who knows? Maybe nothing will blow up in that time, right? But the problem with all these container platforms is that they enable high entropy systems, right? We're, we're kind of advocating for, yeah, go blow away, tear up and tear down your, your, your containers all the time. Um, do all this stuff. Um, just really light it on fire. Continuous integration is, is awesome, right? We're, we're trying to get achieve strength through entropy. And really, we, we got to, I mean, we, we've, we've got we've to know, right? I, like, there's nothing worse than time bombs. If, you, if, some, if, if a system can fail, but it doesn't fail, you're just waiting it to fail, and you have no idea how you'll handle it. So failure injection kind of helps with that. So I created Project Entropy. It's a proof of concept. It's on GitHub. It's a failure injection orchestration platform. It allows you to define probabilistic failure, network failure specifically, as policy. It has, uh, what should we say, just all the different features you expect from an orchestration platform, from event streams to, um, and, and specifically this one integrates on top of the Docker API. That's not, I mean, that's kind of arbitrary, right? Like, you should be able to wrap whatever API you want. In this case, I wrapped Docker API so that I could test locally um, or, or potentially inject fault into a cluster. So I'd like to show you how we can inject failure with a simple command line. So I'm going to show you, can, can everybody see that? Is that OK? Um, so I want to show you on, the, on your right or your left is a compose file. In that compose file, I define a local swarm cluster using Docker and Docker. I have my entropy service that points to that swarm manager. I have clients defined just so that I can actually work within that several layers of, of uh, abstraction. Um, and that's it. Oh, and then I define a couple services. One that just sits there and pings Google, which is my favorite ICMP echo provider, um, or DigitalOcean. So let's get out here and, and play with it. So if you want to run this, I have to do compose up dash D. Oh, I told myself I was going to restart this before. Where's my coffee? <laughs> There's no coffee up here. Mm. Sorry, this. Uh, I'm also running on the 112 candidate for Mac. Uh, OK. There we go. All better.
Hmm. I'm pretty sure that it is. There we go. Maybe. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Gotta get my coffee. Um, so we just created a little swarm, swarm cluster, three nodes inside of the single vir virtual machine using Docker and Docker. Um, so. So I've got a couple of, of services running. Again, one's being in DigitalOcean, one's being in Google. Um, I'm gonna jump over here and just kind of tail that whole thing. Um, let's choose Google this time. Docker client, log-f, and grab Google. Okay, this is pretty standard stuff, right? Everyone's familiar with that output. So I'm just gonna leave that running over there while we play with this stuff. All right, so one thing I wanna do is kind of show that, yeah, this is running on a, on a uh, cluster. So let's do a demo docker client, um, info, grab nodes. We've got three nodes, simple stuff, right? So let's actually, so one of the things that I've done is I've actually applied a label to my services, um, giving them names. So let's look at that. My Docker client, PS. Label equals service. Ping Google. Okay, so I've got one, filtered it down. That's gonna be important. Let's kind of try to keep that filtering in mind. So now I'm gonna create a fault injection, or a failure injector. Um, and I want to roll the dice on the probability every 10 seconds and have that failure last for 10 seconds. So frequency 10, I wanna give it, I mean I'm doing a demo and I wanna make sure it happens, so let's say like, uh, failure probability of 50%. 0.5. Um, and let's, I mean, I'm doing ping. It's difficult to see most failure injection, or most failures. Ooh. But let's choose latency. Um, so failure. So this is gonna inject an arbitrary amount of latency somewhere between a thousand and zero milliseconds. It's almost never zero. Um, now let's go ahead and specify the real meat of the, cri of, of, of the policy, which is criteria. Right? Now I wanna say, okay, of all the things running inside this platform, which pieces should be affected by this failure injection? Right? Like, we have this massive cluster that's running all sorts of different services. I want to only test or inject this kind of failure into my service because I'm making claims that it's latency tolerant. So in order to do that, all I have to do is provide my label. Server equals, equals ping Google. Now, in practice, all I did here was just take this and then throw it into the same filtering mechanisms that the Docker API provides to do that filter above. Um, and so the last thing I wanna show you and that I wanna provide here is an image on Geek uh, Gremlins. So this, this platform is actually payload agnostic. It's only about the abstraction and the semantics for maintaining the desired state. In this system, what it does is it creates a container that runs as a sidekick with a joined network namespace as the targets, right? And so 
any container that comes up that matches these criteria, I create a failure injector for. Anytime one of those targets goes away, I tear down that failure injector, right? Anytime, even after I've made this declaration, that a new container is spun up that meets that criteria, that agent calculates the diff, identifies that as a target, and creates a new failure injector. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and, and drop the bomb here. So right now, inside the swarm cluster, it is pulling from Docker Hub this image. <clears throat> and it's going to spin up a single injector. <clears throat> as soon as that happens. So once this finishes, start keeping your eye on that ping output over there. Because at some point, it's going to roll the dice, and we're going to start seeing additional latency. There we go. So my policy name is Wild-Eyed Monkey. Oh, and you can see almost immediately the dice rolled. It came up latency, All right? So this is kind of neat. Every 10 seconds, there's a 50% probability that it was going to inject this additional latency. You can do packet reordering with this. You can do network partitions. So if you're claiming that your application is partition tolerant, this is a good way to test it. <clears throat> but I want to show a couple other things. Um, let's go ahead and list our policies. I've got one. Tells me that there's one injector. Tells me the, the, the declared state. In this case, my system of record is the cluster itself. I don't, I don't persist anything else external, which kind of like some of the conversations that... Um, that were, that were being had yesterday about uh, daemon, daemonless um, container implementation. How do you actually get in and out of the way? Like the whole problem with persisting state. Um, that's kind of repeated here, right? It's the, same kind of, it's the same kind of thing. At their heart, these are using the same patterns. Um, and, so, and so this is totally dependent on, on only the swarm cluster. So let's go ahead and do one more thing. Um, I want to go ahead and create, oh, I guess I'll show you this first. So let's go ahead and list these again. You can see the very first one is the Gremlins uh, failure injector. Um, I didn't create that container by hand. That was all the orchestration platform. So let's go ahead and down here, um, demo, oh, I can just compose scale. Um, equals one. What I'm going to do is start another copy of that ping in Google instance. Hit PS again. So now you can see the top one is pinging Google. In a couple of seconds, once it finishes pulling that image again to the obviously different node in the cluster, as you can see from the node prefixes, we should see another failure injector pop up. So we can see that the number of injectors is declared as two, back over there. I did nothing else with the entropy client. And we've got another gremlin running. So now every copy of the service, the pinging Google service, has the, that, that desired state has been maintained. They both have failure injectors running now. Does anyone have any questions about this? This is kind of, this is kind of it for the demo. Um, So, yeah, go ahead. So this is really cool, actually. It really simplifies, like, the whole chaos monkey and just kind of brings it into one tiny box. Um, 
I was a little unclear though when you specified an image. Mm -hmm. Was that an image that you already have on Docker Hub, the yep. Gremlins, and that's kind of like the base image for all these latency and different tests? Or? Right. So okay. it, you, the whole point of it is, I wanted to make sure that it was clear that this was like injector. Like the logic of, of failure injection has nothing to do with the orchestration, right? And so there's a nice clear separation here, which also means that it's also very pluggable, right? People can can put in whatever implementation they want. Right? But the, the failure injection part is cool, and it's a nice thing to show off, but what I really wanted to hammer home is the, the, the things like Swarm, I mean, every major orchestration platform provides the visibility and the control plane that you can extend them from outside. This is a totally different service composed on top of the Docker API. Right? It provides an events API, and it provides that control plane. And so I was able to sit back, watch for events, react to deltas, and actually make sure that that state is maintained all from outside of it. So we don't necessarily need to keep shoving you know, abstractions or wait for these platforms to develop the exact abstraction, the exact semantics that we need in order to do our jobs, right? And really, it's a short amount of code. This is total proof of concept quality, but I mean, I did it in four days, right? Like this is, this is something that we can do. We should be empowered by this, right? So it's, and, and really I wanted to kind of bring it back, hammer home, like what you need is the visibility of the system so that you can track it, so you can, so you can update your own system of record, right? Or, or react on your own system of record. Provide your own API and, and client, which in this case it is both a REST API and the command line. I didn't have time to do the web interface. It's not a very visual demo. Um, but, but, and then, and then that, that's uh, the agent, the control loop that actually watches and maintains and makes sure that everything is running. Really, that, that last piece is the biggest difference between your data management REST API, your repository patterns that are just repeated everywhere, right, and something that is truly reactive, that solves some problems on your behalf when you're sleeping, right? That's, that's the cool part. That's where the real logic for these things lives. Um, and if you understand those pieces, it doesn't matter which one you choose, right? Like, I'm a consumer. I don't own any of these things. I'm, I'm by far a fan of all of them because the, in, in the intense competition just makes better products. But so I want to, like, go ahead and, and just really hammer home that you can do these. You, you can adopt any of these. And if you have these kind of patterns in, your, in, in mind, you know, feel confident in your ability to solve the problems that will inevitably, inevitably come up. Any other questions? Could you elaborate a little bit on the actual detail implementation that you've done to introduce such delay? Like, did you alter the state? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the failure injection piece um, uses the Gremlins um, Python library, which internally delegates to traffic control, right? Which is a, it's an awesomely powerful tool. Um, as far as the orchestration piece goes, um, I grabbed a, a popular Golang API, uh, REST API framework, defined an API, um, and then just defined a, a, a Go routine that sits in the background that all it does is, is watch state coming off of that, that Docker daemon, um, and then reply to the API. There's, there's really not much to it. It's, I mean, if you took out all the dead code or just random iteration code that's in this proof of concept, like, it's, I mean, less than a thousand lines of, of in, like, it's less than a couple hundred lines of interesting code, right? Um, it's really, really small, very light. And, and there's a freaking there's a command line client baked into it, right? So it's just, there's really not much there. Um, all the pieces are there. You just you know, find, like, pick your favorite tooling and, and pick your favorite language and, Go ahead and write the stitching yourself, you know? Feel confident in that. Thanks. Oh, one, one, more question. Right one last question over there. Hi. Um, I'm working with each of my containers. Each one is running, is calling a third-party API. Every API has its own conditions as far as timeouts and expectations of how it deal deals with errors and uh, possible retries. Yep. So basically, my, it's like a, a, a cornucopia of apps. Each one is having its own story of defining 
okay, is this a retry or is this really an error situation based upon bad authentication? How do you orchestrate such an environment? <laughs> I think the first step in that is being really honest with yourself what you say or what you want to declare that you can tolerate, right? I mean, step number one. I mean, getting, get, just removing ourselves for, for the moment from best practices for retries and all that kind of stuff, because the reality is you already have a system, right? But first and foremost, be honest with yourself about what you want to be able to tolerate and then test for it and make sure that you can actually tolerate it, right? Because you don't want to be in a situation where you say, I can tolerate X, Y, Z, or this amount of failure, or this amount of retry, or this, like, level of, of denial of service attack or, or whatever, um, and then find out that you can't, right? And, and really, confidence, confidence in your code, confidence in your deployments is, is more about making sure that, that you're, you're not just crossing your fingers, right? Um, that's a terrible situation to be in. That's, that's an operational nightmare. All right, thanks a lot. The two, two last things before heading up to lunch. So the first thing is that Jeff was looking for uh, three like Docker beginners. I know this is the black belt track, but if there are beginners here, come talk to Jeff just after. And the second thing is just let's applause one more time for this amazing talk about building confidence thanks. into systems. <laughs> awesome.